take you to see with me something of the land of Siam, a land of strange contrast in the faraway Orient. Here we have the only independent, absolute monarchy existing today, yet the people enjoy as much freedom as they do anywhere else in the world. And here we have a strange mixture of East and West, ancient colorful ceremonies side by side with the most modern mechanical improvements. You would feel at home here, as I do, for the Siamese are a friendly, happy people. It is my good fortune to dwell among these people and to share their lives, and I am happy to be selected as your guide for the unfolding of some of the magnificent and spectacular ceremonies which you will witness in these films. <laughs> Tucked away in southeastern Asia lies Siam, shaped like the head of an elephant and traditionally known as the land of white elephants. Perhaps no city in the Far East has retained so much of the color and glamour of the Orient as Bangkok. It has been called the jewel city of Asia, but the Venice of the East is probably a more suitable name, for the whole city is laced with canals, although it has paved highways as well. Waterways constitute one of the chief transportation systems of the country. There are no drive problems here. The Siamese of the great central plain are water people, as much at home in boats as on land. They have even been called web-footed. The favorite home of many Siamese is a floating house with the river as a front yard, and they're always dropping in on each other. The floating market is one of the centers of river life. In the early morning hours, a vast array of delicious tropical fruits and vegetables are brought from nearby truck farms. The market is crowded with boats and buyers, and it's a noisy place for the ladies are in the majority. Siamese women wore short hair more than a century before modern flappers started crowding men out of barber shops. In the olden days, an enemy army raided a Siamese city and dragged away many hundreds of girls by their long hair. After that, Siamese women cut their hair short and adopted the costumes of men so they would not be recognized by the enemy as women. This fast little craft is tricky to operate it must be balanced with a paddle, which is never lifted long from the water, or out you go. I tried it one day myself, and I'm glad there was no camera present to register my ducking. It is as natural for a Siamese to paddle a boat as to walk. Siam is a nation of magnificent temples, gorgeous gems of architecture splashed with gold and brilliant colors which sparkle in the tropical sunlight. The great spire of this temple is colored with colorful bits of glass and chinaware from a porcelain-laden ship which was wrecked off the coast many years ago. Here is the temple of the Golden Mount on an artificial hill constructed under the supervision of a Siamese king who wearied of the flat landscape of Bangkok. is Wat Benchema Bopit, a temple of pure white marble with tiled roof of brilliant orange, one of the most gorgeous sights in the whole Orient. This temple, known popularly as the Temple of the Five Kings, is used for informal royal ceremonials. The prevailing religion is Buddhism, and the people are very proud of their faith. Buddhism in Siam is more a philosophy of life than a doctrinaire religion. The rules and commandments for a good life are similar to the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament. Here is the gallery of images of the Buddha. 
The first figure you saw represent the Buddha when he was fasting as an aid to the attainment of knowledge. The central figure of the Buddha in Siamese temples is a figure of peace and serene content. The figure here is not that of the Buddha, but an image representing a wise man. The little girl is not praying, but merely paying her respect to wisdom. Even the Buddha is considered a great teacher rather than a divinity. The unique festival of Koh Prasai is held every year in the grounds of many Bangkok temples. The chief part of the ceremony is the building of small sand mounds, which are elaborately decorated. The festival has its origin in the fact that Bangkok is in a low-lying delta, and soil is very scarce and precious. So it is considered an act of merit to bring sand and soil to build up the temple grounds. Visitors place money on artificial trees as contributions to the temple. Siam is a land of colorful and spectacular festivals. During certain seasons of the year, there is some sort of popular or religious festival or fair going on most of the time. fond of the theater, especially classical dancing. The girls are trained from childhood, and they look very picturesque in their elaborate costumes. They wear no musical comedy scanties, and in their dancing there is no element of sensuality. You see, there are no tired businessmen here. Perhaps there is no game in the world requiring more skill than the Siamese game of the crawl, which is played with a ball made of reed. The players try to kick the ball through a ring of flowers, and they attempt to keep the ball bouncing about in the air as long as possible. They kick it with feet, legs, knees, elbows, head, heels, and ankles. The players must be extremely agile and alert. There it goes, right through the hole. Another goal. Siamese boxing contest opens with a sort of weird dance to the strains of an orchestra. The dance symbolizes that the fighters are looking over the ground for the combat. All during the round, the orchestra plays, starting slowly and getting faster and faster, encouraging the boxers to fight furiously.
Siamese boxing is the real art of self-defense. It teaches defense against everything. Kicks, fist blows, elbow jabs, knee punches, or what have you. One of the favorite blows is knee to chin, which is often a knockout. Here's another kind of blow, known as the rear attack. Siamese boxing is not cluttered up with a lot of rules and red tape. They go in to fight, and they do. Oh boy, what a fight! Look at that fellow, he's woozy. There he goes, he's down. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. By the count of 20, he is definitely out. Cremations are held in the grounds of temples amid the chanting of priests who recite chapters from the scriptures which point out the impermanence of earthly things. All material things change and die. Earthly life is subject to birth, old age, sickness, and death. Only the spirit lives on forever. The funeral pyre is lit by a priest, or in the case of a prominent man, by some member of the royal family, with fire which has been brought from temple candles. Then relatives of the dead man pass by the pyre, adding little sticks of wood or small candles to the flames. The rare and perhaps the last picture of King Rama VI, taken with some of the members of his family just before his death a few years ago. He was a poet king, a playwright king, who translated Shakespeare into Siamese and whose original plays are now classics of the Siamese theater. He was a capable, good-natured, and beloved ruler who longed for a son but who died without a male heir. In the vanguard of his cremation procession, a lofty carriage bears the Prince Patriarch, High Priest of Siamese Buddhism. The procession is a glittering array of men in ancient and modern uniforms. The gold encrusted and brilliantly jeweled urn contains the body of the king, which is in a kneeling position of prayer. It is brought to the cremation pavilion in a gigantic and magnificent funeral carriage of state. As it arrives at the cremation grounds, the urn is lowered to another carriage and the procession passes slowly three times around the court of the pavilion before the earthly remains of the great monarch are carried to the high funeral pyre. The new king and queen are born in palanquins to join the cremation procession.
The favorite horse of the late king follows the body. This marvelously beautiful cremation pavilion cost half a million to calls, about $250,000. For each royal cremation, a new pavilion must be built. Even the same materials cannot be used for a similar purpose again. The wood is usually presented to various temples. The new king lights the funeral pyre of his august predecessor. Then follow relatives and high officials of state, placing gold-tipped sticks of scented oriental wood on the mounting flames. And so the soul of a great and benevolent monarch is released for a higher life. Prince Prajadipak, brother of his late majesty, begins the elaborate ceremonies which will elevate him formally to the throne. The first step in the coronation is the ceremonial bath, symbol of purification. The waters are brought from the five great rivers of Siam. This ceremony is supervised by a high priest of the Brahmin sect. Buddhism is a simple religion, almost devoid of pomp and ceremony. So the Siamese have adopted Brahmin rites for formal and ceremonial occasions. In a magnificent chamber of the Grand Palace, the coronation continues. The prince who is about to become king places the heavy crown of gold on his head himself, as it is forbidden for anyone else to touch the head of a king. He is suffering from a good old-fashioned case of stage fright, as anyone would who realizes with due seriousness the grave responsibilities of being an absolute monarch. Considering the difficulties under which the photographer was laboring to get these pictures, and considering that they were not staged for motion picture reproduction, I hope you will appreciate them all the more. He is presented with the ancient symbols of authority, a lance, a scepter, and a sword, 800 years old. As a symbol of his benevolence, he scatters artificial flowers of gold and silver before him. He pours lustral water into a golden bowl to symbolize the mingling of his virtues with those of his predecessors. Finally, surrounded by the royal guard, he mounts the magnificent golden throne. It is an awkward throne to mount, so he is fully seated before the curtains are drawn aside to reveal this gorgeous sight to those in the audience chamber. And now behold, his Majesty King Prajodipak, Admiral of the Navy, Commander of the Army, Supporter of the Faith, and Supreme Ruler of Siam. His Majesty mounts the royal palanquin, carved in a lotus design, to make his first appearance 
in the capital city to be acclaimed by the populace. This new king is an exceptionally able young man. Educated in Europe, he is thoroughly modern in his outlook, but retains the ideals of Siam's ancient culture. His only thought is the welfare of his people. In the case of young princes, such as these, this ceremony is a state occasion under royal auspices. Their costumes are of rich gold and silver brocaded cloth. The collars are of gold filigree. The anklets are ancient Siamese jewelry. From childhood, Siamese children wear little tufts of hair at the top of the head. This is an old Brahmin custom, dating from before the days of Buddha. It was believed then that there was a microscopic hole in the top of the head through which the soul entered at birth. The ceremony today, however, is merely a tradition. The top knot is divided into three sections. In the case of royal children, the king cuts off one section with gold-encrusted scissors. A priest cuts off another with silvered scissors, while the last is severed by a near relative with ordinary shears. popular with the military forces, for he was trained as a military man and served as an artillery officer before he ascended the throne. During his training, he served with the British and French armies. King never expected to come to the throne, but two of his elder brothers died in a short space of time. Even then, there was hope that his brother, King Rama VI, would be blessed with a male heir. A royal infant was expected even as King Rama lay on his deathbed. A child was born, but it was a girl, and Siam does not have ruling queens. A few hours later, King Rama was dead. So King Prajatipak came unexpectedly to the throne, but he has fully proved his worth as a statesman and administrator. For the Royal Review, the ancient method of Siamese warfare is reproduced when men fought with pikes and lances from the backs of elephants. It was usual for the king to lead his men fearlessly into the din and clatter of battle. Before the World War, in which Siam was one of the Allies, this peaceful country had not fought a real war for almost a century and a half, but the army is always kept up to fighting trim. its flivers, radios, railways, air mails, buses, and even miniature golf. With such a modern king and queen leading them, 
the people are rapidly adapting up-to-date methods without abandoning their ancient culture. But I hope they will never become so westernized that they will forget these gorgeous ceremonies. And I hope they will never become so engrossed in modernization that they lose their gentleness, their good humor, and the peace of their spirits.